Namaste. And welcome to the next episode of Yoga Vasishta. And this one is going to be about the danger of misusing human life. Human life is as frail as a drop of water trembling on the tip of a leaflet. Life, breaking loose from its bodily imprisonment out of its proper season, is as irrepressible as a raving madman. The lives of those whose minds are infected by the poison of worldly affairs and who are incapable of judging for themselves are only causes for their torment. Those knowing the knowable and resting in the all-pervading spirit and acquiescing alike to their wants and gains enjoy lives of perfect tranquility. We who have a certain belief that we are only limited beings can have no enjoyment in our transient lives, which are only flashes of lightning in the cloudy sky of the world. So a lotus leaf has a coating on it that repels water. You can take a lotus leaf and just shake it and all the water simply falls off. So in the scriptures, human life is compared to a drop of dew, morning dew on a lotus leaf. And the morning sun is coming up. Huh? So what's going to happen first? A breeze is going to come along and, and shake the leaf and the drop falls off. Or the sun is going to come up and evaporate it by its heat. Take your pick. Huh? Either way, you're throwing the dice. It's just a chance. It's a random thing. We never know when we're going to die. Oh, we can assume that I'm going to live a full, long life. But that's an unwarranted assumption. There are so many stories of even young, healthy people just suddenly dying. It can happen anytime. So, like he says, when the life breaks loose from its bodily imprisonment out of its proper season, it's like a raving madman. One does not know where one is going in the next life. There is no way to attain any specific destination because one has not prepared for death through yoga. By yoga, it's possible to transfer your life to any destination you want. That's the techniques of Tantra and devotional service and so on. They're designed for that. But if your life is cut short and you have no idea when it could be, you could be driving along on the highway and some drunk in the other lane crosses onto your side of the road and it's finished. Just like that, you have no warning. So don't think, oh, I'm going to grow old and have plenty of time for meditation. No. That's very unwise. Life could end at any time. You better be ready. And he says that a person whose mind is infected by worldly affairs and who has no means of judging for himself, in other words, who can't think for himself, who doesn't know the laws of karma and spiritual life, uh, that kind of life is only a cause for torment. Well, why is that? You're going to have so many regrets. You're going to do so many things that you wished you hadn't done. And at the time of death, you're going to create a very much a lower birth for yourself, pursued by all these bad acts and bad thoughts. So a person who has no spiritual life, who has no knowledge by which to judge, doesn't know the results of what his actions are. He has no idea this is going to create a body Actually, every moment, everything that we think, say, and do is creating the body for the next life. We don't understand this because we don't understand the process of becoming. 
which I've gone over in so many videos. <laughs> so what you have to do is realize that the scriptures actually know the way. They're there to guide us. And by following their principles, we create a good situation for ourselves in the next life. So we don't have to regret. We don't have to suffer. So those who know the knowable live a life of perfect tranquility because they understand all this. Huh? They don't have to worry. They don't have to deal with uncertainty. Oh my God, what's going to happen after death? They know because as uh, someone, I forget who, famously said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So if we are actively creating our being in the next life, then we already know where we're going after death because we've chosen it and we're deliberately creating it through the process of yoga. This world, samsara, is as a whirlpool in the ocean of creation and every individual body is as impermanent as foam, froth, or a bubble, which can give me no relish in this life. True living is gain which is worth gaining, which has no cause of sorrow or remorse, and which is a state of transcendental tranquility. There is a vegetable life in plants and an animal life in beasts and birds, Man leads a thinking life, but true life is above thoughts. All those living beings who, being born here once and do not return, are said to have lived well in this earth. The rest are no better than old asses. So, <laughs> this is actually very profound. The Buddha also mentions the whirlpool. And of course, the whirlpool is false becoming. Becoming and entering into being in the material world. Because the material world is simply like bubbles of foam. The material body is here today and gone tomorrow. We don't remember how we were born in this body. But the Buddha does, and he has given the process of becoming Paticca Samuppada and likened it to a whirlpool. And a whirlpool is a vortex, and a vortex has the property of creating fake density due to turbulence. We've been over this in many past videos. If you've been following our different series, you've already uh, heard me speak on this numerous times. So Rama shows here that he is conversant with all these truths. That this, for one who knows, is a coded statement relating to the deep, deep truths of the science of becoming. So, okay, <laughs> what now? Well, he says a body that's impermanent like this can give me no relish. I can't take pride or enjoyment in this body when I know that it's just impermanent like a bubble and one of these days, pop, and it'll be gone. It can happen that fast. So the impermanence of life really ruins everything, you know? We, we can't really make plans except that we know we're going to die and to prepare for it properly. And that's why all the information is given in the scriptures on this process of becoming and how we can use it for our own good in the future. So he's saying here that the real human life is one of transcendental tranquility, which is above thoughts. Mind is always thinking, huh? 24 hours a day, yada, 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 yada. But real life, is beyond the mind. When the mind is made peaceful through yogic meditation, uh, a good way to, to do that is to start with mantras and then gradually concentrate until you see the light. 
and then just stick with that light. <laughs> Follow that light back to its source and you will find the self, the real self, pure consciousness without mind, pure subjectivity without an object. That is the real life. Once one knows the self, then the object of all yogas is attained. So it doesn't matter if you have wealth or you don't, or you have a big circle of friends or none. Huh? But actually, it's found that people who live alone have an easier time because they don't have to deal with the constant distractions in politics and all the nonsense that people bring up. Uh, to try to control you and stuff. So it's actually better to be poor and alone because you have all your time and energy for self-realization. Knowledge is a burden to the unthinking. Wisdom is a burden to the passionate. Intellect is a heavy load to the restless and the body is a ponderous burden to one ignorant of his soul. The discontented mind is the great arena of all evils and the nesting place of diseases which alight upon it like birds of the air. Such a life is the abode of toil and misery. Youth forsakes us as soon as a good man who after a few days learns of his wicked friend's faults abandons him in disgust. Death the lover of destruction and friend of old age and ruin, likes the sensual man as a lecher likes a beauty. Thus there is nothing so worthless in the world as this life, which is devoid of every good quality and ever subject to death, unless it is attended by the permanent joy of liberation. Rama says it all here. <laughs> And he doesn't hold back, does he? So we meet people every day who consider this wisdom, this knowledge, as a great burden. Huh? People of unstable mind who cannot fix their attention in concentration and who cannot still their minds in meditation. They have to run after all kinds of desires and of course, this is miserable. So, of course, this doesn't apply to Rama exactly, although he has certainly experienced it before. But he has really seen the prevalence of this condition in the human condition outside the palace. And now he's lamenting it. Look at these poor rascals, driven by their restless minds, they have to do all manner of evil to earn money. And then when they come home after their uh, restless activities day and night, they can't even be quiet and silent. The mind keeps going and going. Huh? Greed drives them to collect more and more. They're never satisfied, never at peace. What a shame. So youth is going to abandon us like a good man who finds his friend full of evil acts. Huh? He just abandons him in disgust. And death is going to be after us like a lecher after a beauty. Huh? <laughs> what vivid similes Rama uses. So all of this human life is basically useless and just a burden unless one attains liberation. Liberation means the end of suffering. No more fear, no more desire, no more greed, no more lust. Huh? Lust, hatred, and delusion are the three roots of material becoming. So when one attains liberation, one becomes free of those. That's the fourth path of Buddha's path of enlightenment. The fourth path means these three things, lust, hatred, and delusion, which are all mutually dependent on one another, all fall down.
And then one is left without a mind. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. So Rama here is laying the foundation for the path of sadhana to attain enlightenment, which is liberation, meaning the end of all suffering. Om Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam